Ooh, man, that's good. Isla Manhattan. Not for everybody, but definitely for me. Look, this is probably gonna surprise some people, maybe anger a few of you, and I wouldn't be surprised if some of you get so pissed off after 30 seconds into this video that you just click out of it and go watch something else. I wouldn't blame you whatsoever. But my job on the film room is to be as honest with you guys as humanly possible, and so this episode is dedicated to honesty. Despite what consensus may say, I truly believe that Notre Dame's Jeremiah Owusu Koromoa is the best linebacker in this entire draft class. And if you stick with me until the end of this show, I might just be able to convince you to. One, two, three, fuck it. Look, I get it. There's some shock, some surprise, maybe a little bit of indignation at the very thought that Notre Dame's Jeremiah Owusu Koromoa is the best linebacker in this class and not Penn State's Micah Parsons. And trust me, I understand the argument going the other way. Like, I'm not an idiot. Parsons is a freak of nature. It makes sense to make him the top rated linebacker. But the reason why I currently have Owusu Koromoa in my top spot is that relative to Parsons, I think he's a little bit more ready to make an impact from day one. Now, before I can really dig into his unique skill set and why I think he's the more pro-ready player, you first need to understand how Notre Dame used him in their defense and why the Fighting Irish system was so different than literally every single team in the NFL. Though, to be fair, the reason why it was so different was because they had a player like Owusu Koromoa that kind of let them get away with it. Notre Dame, believe it or not, played base personnel against three wide receiver or four wide receiver sets 45% of the time, meaning almost half the time that they were faced with an extra receiver, they did not swap out a linebacker or a defensive lineman to bring an extra corner into the game, and instead, on most snaps, Owusu Koromoa himself would end up covering that third receiver in the slot. For reference, the highest rate of base personnel on defense in the NFL against 11 or 10 personnel was the Steelers last season, who did it about 8% of the time, far below Notre Dame's rate, obviously. And even then, Pittsburgh was still a huge outlier because no other team in the league dared to do that more than 3% of the time. To put it mildly, the Fighting Irish defense was kind of a unicorn compared to everyone else in college football and in the NFL, for the sole reason that they could get away with having a linebacker out in space against wide receivers without any real consequences because of his speed. Now, you might be wondering why Notre Dame did this. Why not just keep Owusu Koromoa in the box and just put a third corner on the field like everyone else does? And to put it bluntly, they avoided swapping personnel on and off the field because they wanted to keep things as simple for their young players as possible. If you are a 19 or 20 year old college kid and you have to learn the fronts and coverages that are associated with only one or two, maybe three main personnel packages at most, and you really only have to know one position within those packages, it's a lot less information for a college player with limited practice time and no real offseason to take in. So, the Irish defense was extremely simple as a result, but also far easier for their players to execute without making any major mistakes. On principle, for example, Notre Dame almost always predicated their defensive alignment on where the ball was spotted. And in particular, if the ball was spotted on a hash, you had players that always lined up on the field side of the formation, where there's a lot more space naturally for the offense to work with, and you had guys that always lined up on the boundary side, which was a bit more compacted. 
the corners, safeties, and linebackers, including Owusu Koromoa, all had very specific alignments that were all determined by whether they were a field side player or a boundary side player. And usually they did not line up based on offensive formation or by where certain personnel matchups were, which is what you commonly see in the NFL with things like shadow corners that follow around a team's number one wide receiver no matter where they line up. For instance, Owusu Koromoa in particular always lined up as the field side outside linebacker. A lot of coaches refer to this spot kind of ubiquitously as the nickel Sam position, meaning someone who basically plays the role of an outside linebacker and a nickel corner at the same time, and he has a lot of different responsibilities because of that hybrid role. In most defenses that utilize nickel Sam players, that kind of role has to be able to handle slot receivers because most of the time, if there is going to be a slot formation on offense, it's going to be to the field side where there's more space to work with, hence why Iwusu Koromoa had so many reps in the slot. But unlike traditional slot defenders, if the passing strength of the formation with those slot receivers was into the boundary side of the field, Owusu Koromoa had to have the ability to bump inside the tackles, but still on the field side of the defense, to basically act as a traditional linebacker playing the run in the box while everyone else cheated over to the other side to play the pass. So, on any given play, due to motions or whatever, Owusu Koromoa could have found himself covering a wide receiver deep down the field, or folding inside to play against the run as a traditional linebacker, just depending on how many offensive players lined up on his side. He never actually got to choose his matchups, and in fact it was the other way around, and offenses would actually dictate whatever matchups they wanted against him instead. And truth be told, because of that required versatility in this role as someone who never got to move around and who almost always had to basically handle everything for an entire half of the defense, Owusu Koromoa was one of the only players in all of college football that could actually do this at a high level. The only reason Notre Dame's defense did not completely collapse under the weight of their own predictability was because Joker is just that damn special. Even when offenses knew exactly where he was going to be and what he was going to do on every single play, he still beat them. Whether it was covering slot receivers in space, or carrying deep threats down the field, or helping to get pressure as a blitzer, or even just fitting against the run game inside the tackles, he did everything for the Irish. And he did it all at an elite level. It didn't matter his size, it didn't matter his length, he beat everyone. I mean, even Clemson and Alabama, for how talented those teams were, they both actively avoided putting the ball anywhere near him because almost every time they did, he made them pay for it. Tackles for loss, turnovers, defensive touchdowns, you name it. When elite teams tried to go after him in a variety of ways, more often than not, he held up and he made them regret it. Hell, even when Bama got the exact look they wanted from him and caught him in a blitz when they ran counter to his side behind a 360-pound guard named Deontay Brown, Owusu was still able to get in on the tackle by recognizing that call, putting his foot in the ground, and shooting over the top of Brown to make the play. And by the way, that wasn't even his gap. He's technically only responsible for just boxing in that playside B-gap and funneling everything back the other way, but again, just because of his instincts and his quickness, he knew that he could fold back in and go make that tackle anyway out of his gap. There's not a lot of linebackers at the college level that can process information and redirect that quickly and let alone do it against Alabama. As hyperbolic as this sounds, he's not just one of the fastest players on the field or one of the most fluid or one of the most physical, he's one of the smartest players on the field too. Overall, this is a rare, ideal, modern linebacker we're talking about here. Yes, he may be on the small side, but he's incredibly instinctive, he's a fantastic leader on and off the field, he's got sideline to sideline range, he can obviously cover like a DB, and because this bears repeating, he's so polished that you don't really have to coach him up. From day one, he is ready to go. What you see is what you get, and what you get is a Pro Bowl caliber linebacker. I have zero doubts about that at all. But where does that kind of Pro Bowl caliber linebacker fit the best schematically among all the teams that are picking in the first round? It's a great question, and to be honest, I have a lot of ideas for what his best scheme fits in the first round are. 
But before we get to all those, I do want to take a moment to thank our sponsor for the day, Hawthorne. Hawthorne is a premium men's tailored grooming kit that is here to help guys start 2021 the right way by looking, smelling, and feeling their best. All you have to do is take a quick quiz online at Hawthorne's website where they'll ask you questions on everything from your type of skin to your type of hair to your favorite fragrance and of course your favorite drink and they'll come up with a personalized list of products from their catalog that fits your needs and from there you can pick which products you want and which ones you don't. Personally, I love everything that Hawthorne has ever sent me, but particularly this winter because it's so dry. If you're not familiar with Southern California winters, it's like less than 10% humidity for two months straight and it's windy and it's awful because my skin sucks. But this lotion really saves my ass. It's not oily. It doesn't kind of leave me looking shiny. It's very high quality stuff and I could not survive this winter without it. It's phenomenal. If you take the quiz yourself and you decide that there are some products you want to try, Hawthorne can take all of the risk out of it because you get free shipping on your order and on any returns. And if you don't even like your products, they can retailer them for you based on your feedback. I really can't recommend these guys enough. They're a great brand. They've stuck with me for a long time. And if you go through their catalog and you see anything that you like that you want to try, you can use my promo code at the link in the description below. That is hawthorne.co promo code filmroom10 and that can get you a 10% discount on whatever products you want. Again, that is promo code filmroom10 at that link in the description below for a 10% discount on your order. And with that being said, let's move on to probably the most important part of this entire episode. Where does Jeremiah Owusu Koromoa fit the best in the NFL? Honestly, the list of teams that Owusu Koromoa doesn't fit is probably a lot smaller than the list of teams he does. But in terms of teams that I think realistically could take him in the first round, that I also know for a fact would use him correctly, the first team that I immediately jump to is Denver. When you look at how Vic Fangio structures his defense, it's very demanding on the linebackers. They have to have range and versatility above all else, mainly because the vast majority of the time, his defense is going to be operating from a too high safety shell meaning they're going to play a lot of quarters coverage and variations of cover two that still have the corners sinking deep outside anyway. So the linebackers are generally going to be accountable for a ton of space underneath in pass coverage. They need to have the range and the coverage ability to handle that. And you also have to remember that this defense tends to cover running backs with linebackers no matter what, not with safeties. So if you're going up against a running back like say, oh, I don't know, every single back in this division, you need to have linebackers that can hold up against those guys. Enter Owusu Koromoa, of course, who shares some similarities to another small-ish linebacker that Fangio drafted high a few years ago, Roquan Smith, except Owusu is probably even faster than Roquan, which says a lot because Smith is one of the fastest linebackers in the league as it is. He is a perfect fit for what Vic Fangio needs to help complete this defense. And that is no disrespect to Josie Jewell, by the way. I actually like Jewell a lot. But physically speaking, from a coverage and range standpoint, this is honestly probably not the defense for him. Owusu Koromoa would be a far better fit. And I have zero problems with taking him in the top 10 picks because he's probably one of the 10 best players in this class anyway. After Denver, the next obvious choice to me is Las Vegas because their defense was awful last year and one of the biggest reasons why was because their linebackers couldn't cover anyone. In particular, Corey Littleton really struggled in coverage, so much so that he actually gave up more yards than the next two linebackers in terms of snaps played, Nicholas Moreau and Nick Kwiatkowski combined. He really, really struggled, and I think picking Owusu Koromoa, who's just flat out a better player at this point, could help get Gus Bradley's defense off on the right foot. Plus, after the 2021 season, if Littleton doesn't miraculously get better, the Raiders can designate him as a post-June 1st cut next offseason and save $11 million in cap space while only incurring a $2 million dead cap hit. So if you can get a better linebacker for cheaper long term and still save cap space next summer, that seems like a pretty good deal to me. And then finally, one of my favorite fits for Owusu Koromoa in the entire first round is the Jets all the way down at pick 23. New Jets defensive coordinator Jeff Ulbrich has a history of working with smaller, faster linebackers and getting the most out of them. 
Eric Kendricks and Deion Jones being the best examples of former pupils of his at UCLA and in Atlanta, respectively. And I think he's going to take one look at Joker and his skill set and know that he's the guy. And that's not to say that the Jets are lacking in linebacker talent at the moment. They will likely have CJ Mosley back next season. And I was a pretty big fan of Blake Cashman as well when he was coming out of college a couple years ago. But realistically speaking, none of the current linebackers on the Jets roster can do the things in coverage and in space that Owusu Koromoa can do. He is extraordinarily rare in that department, and I think Ulbrich is going to zero in on him to play a will linebacker role in base personnel and the money backer role in nickel that plays on the passing strength of the offensive formation, and he's going to turn him loose on the AFC East to do what he does best. He's basically a much faster version of Matt Milano, and Matt Milano's already a tremendously good football player in that division, so you can only imagine how good Owusu Koromoa can be as well. Truth be told, beyond the Broncos, Raiders, and Jets, a player like Joker really does fit every single team in some way. So you could theoretically throw out any destination and it would probably make sense. He may be unique, but part of that uniqueness is that he can play in any system for any coach at honestly whatever position they want him to. I have zero doubts in my mind that Jeremiah owusu koromoa is going to have a very long, very good NFL career. And whether his position is defensive back or linebacker or something in between, he's going to be damn good at his job. So whether you're finding this episode well before the draft or your team just drafted him and you googled his name and this video popped up, just know this. Jeremiah is the best linebacker in this draft class. And if you are lucky enough to root for his future NFL team for the next 10 years, congratulations. Your Sundays are about to get a lot more fun. Cheers. One, two, three, fuck it.